Welcome to this episode of uh, Garden Grounds. We're on episode 35. Uh, well, it's just about 11 o'clock, so we will get started. So Garden Grounds, well, actually, let me take care of the chat here and pop out the questions. Give me a second. All right, so and just it looks like everything's working. Just give me a shout that you can see me, hear me, okay. So garden ground, <laughs> yeah, voice crack. So garden grounds is a series, a public series that I do um, every second Thursday, every fourth Thursday of the month at eleven a.m. And I usually have a light topic, but it's really for you guys to ask questions about gardening, and I will answer as many questions as I can in about 45 minutes. So it's really important um, that you put the word question in front of your question because a lot goes through the chat and it's hard for me to kind of pick out the question sometimes. And if you notice I miss your question and a lot of stuff has gone by, maybe post it again. I also have perk memberships, which you can find on my YouTube channel. And I do this type of format four or five times a month. Plus I do two live classes and I have a series called Grow As We Grow where Perk members can send me in videos. I put them together with a video tour that I do, and we launch that every month. So again, this is the public event. Anybody can watch this two times a month, second Thursday, fourth Thursday of each month at 11 o'clock. So let's get started with some of the questions. Um, question one, how well does spray, the spray liquid fence work for rabbits? So I don't think it works well. It will work probably initially. Um, I've used not for rabbits, but for other things. And it's usually like urine or it's egg solids and it just stinks. And I don't find it to be really effective because if it was, you would hear how rabbits never get into gardens. Everybody would just put down the liquid fence. Whether or not it works well initially, you know, that's up to you. But what does happen is, is once it rains, it's gone and you have to keep applying it. So it can get expensive. I mean, if you wanna give it a try, I would give it a try once, but I would try not to spend a lot of money on it. The best thing that I found that works for rabbits, of course, is a fence, but you can just get plain old chicken wire. I have a video on it that I did last week. It's just, I think it's called Stop Rabbits. And it's about how you can use chicken wire to lay over some of your crops. They're not gonna skid under it. They're, um, or they're not gonna scoot under it, they're skittish. They don't like doing that. So it really keeps the rabbits away and you don't need to have a fence for that. I find that that's more effective. Um, day five has a question. Oh, I actually could do question marks too. That works instead of the word question. Uh, he or she writes, why do my lettuce seedlings not seem to grow and stay low to the surface of the starting tray? Everything else that I plant and use same seedling mix will grow, gain true leaves, and just do better. And then part two is the lettuce seedlings do grow and thrive once planted, but they never get tall in my trays, even with sufficient fertilizing under the grow lights. The answer is I don't know. If it's the same variety of lettuce, sometimes they take longer to get started. If it's multiple types of varieties of lettuce and they're all doing the same thing, I don't I don't really know the answer. I mean, because they sound healthy, you're feeding them, you're watering them, other plants are doing well. Once you get them into the ground, they tend to take off. Um, so the answer is definitely, I don't know. You might try potting them into bigger cells, um, and I sell larger cells at my seed job. I'm not trying to sell you them. But that's the only thing I can think of, is maybe in a smaller starting cell, they just don't seem to take off, even though the other plants do. So you would have to change things. You could try a different seed variety, a different fertilizer, um, or a larger seed cell maybe, and the root systems will get bigger and maybe the plants take off better, but I don't know. Robert, how often should I fertilize and hill my sweet potato plants? So you don't hill sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes aren't really true potatoes. Like potatoes that are indeterminate varieties you plant in the ground and as they grow, you hill up them. Sweet potatoes, you're just putting in slips. I don't have any here. I just took my sweet potatoes downstairs. You put the slips into the ground and it's a plant and they just grow down, the roots grow down, the roots form down there, the rhizomes, I believe they're the rhizomes. 
I don't know if they're tubers or rhizomes, but the sweet potato forms under the ground. You don't have to hill up. I actually trellis my sweet potato vines because they get really long. Now, sometimes if you take a vine and you press it into the ground in other places, roots will, will grow out. Those roots will go into the earth and then you'll get more sweet potatoes. But as for hilling, these vines can get five or six feet tall, so it, it would just be massive. I find it's just best to plant the slips a little more closely together than you think. Cover the space with freshly planted slips because they start growing first, obviously, because they're just put in the ground. And those roots grow for a longer period, meaning if you put the slips in on May 1st, those roots are growing for the whole season. You get nicer potatoes. If you try and bury part of the stem later in May or in June, those roots are going to grow. They're going to form potatoes, but they're getting started later. So sweet potatoes like a longer period of time to form. I would just go with more slips closely together, set up the soil, let them go. All right, a couple more questions. And today I'm going to talk about um, succession planting of cool weather crops. Just a little bit of a um, discussion on that. Just trying to find out where we are here. Okay, I bottom water, but sometimes after 30 minutes, the water still doesn't reach the top of my seed starting. The, the top of the cell. My starting mix is peat moss based. So sometimes if you have too much peat moss and it dries out a whole lot before you water, it becomes hydrophobic and it's hard to absorb water. And sometimes to fix that, you do have to water the top of the tray. If you're making it yourself, adding in some more vermiculite helps. If you're buying it in a bag, it should be fine. So the answer really is that if it's a good quality starting mix, it should wick the water up right away. Um, my question would be that, you know, after 60 minutes, does it wick its way up? If so, you just have to leave it in longer and, and let it do its thing. But there's no real reason except that there's too much peat moss and that it dried out too much and it's slower at wicking up. Dorothy, can you please talk about how to use worm castings? So worm castings, I'm assuming you're talking about buying them in a bag and they are really good for your garden. However, they're expensive, so I wouldn't toss them all over your garden and I wouldn't use them in excess. I'd use them in a very targeted way. So when I'm growing in my vertical towers, um, I grow in, um, why did I forget the name? Green Stuff Garden Vertical Towers. If you're interested in growing vertically, please check out the video description. But because they're a container, and for my containers, I will add in at times, depending on how I've prepped the soil, you know, a couple tablespoons of worm casting. So like in the pocket of that vertical tower, you know, I set it, I open it up, get ready to put the plant in, you know, a tablespoon or a sprinkle of castings, mix it through, put the plant in there. If I'm going into like a bigger container where I'm growing, um, you know, I might take a half a cup and sprinkle it across the top and mix it through, using it in a very targeted kind of manner. It does save you some money and you get the great benefits. If I'm going out into my earth beds, I'll dig a hole, I don't know, 10 inches wide, eight inches deep, throw in a half a cup of castings there, mix it through, and I will put in my you know, tomato transplant. So I use it in that method. I only use it to set up the holes. I don't add it in later. Um, I also don't use it as much now, you know, full disclosure, because I'm growing, or I'm growing, I'm making so much leaf compost and other compost. I just have products that already have the castings in there, but that's how I would use them. Moon, I had late blight last year. Does that mean it will happen every year? Um, most likely, yes, and this is true for every garden. If you get diseases and pests, it's not your fault. They're in the area. They overwinter on plants outside your garden. They fly in from other places. They drift in in the wind. They come in on spores. So it's not your fault that the garden's not clean or anything like that. All you can really do is try and figure out the date that it shows up. And I believe you said tomatoes. Let me just take a look. Uh, I'm going to assume it's tomatoes, but you'll get the point. So if you get late blight coming onto the tomatoes, just say January, or I'm sorry, uh, July 15th, start spraying 
July 1st, and I recommend checking out my video on hydrogen peroxide spray in tomatoes. It's changed the way that I garden. We get early blight here. As soon as I see the fungal pattern show up on my plants, if I don't spray it soon enough, I just spray with hydrogen peroxide, kills off the fungus, slows it down. Sometimes it goes away, the plant is fine, and I don't get early blight breakouts anymore. You can use it for different plants, um, but you know, check out my videos for that. So you would be spraying two weeks early, and this could be for any plant. You know, This could be for any problem in your garden. It's a fungus or a disease. You pick whatever fungicide, fungicide you like, whatever spray you like, and try and spray two weeks before that problem shows up. And then you spray like every 10 to 14 days through the period of the problem. Like early blight, late blight, say they just come at July 1st, then they go away because temperatures change July 30th. You want to spray from July 1 to probably August 15th just to cover that span and it reduces the damage from fungus. All right, so at this point, let me just say I have the PERC memberships. If you like this format, again, I do the Q&A four or five times a month plus some other things and you can join through my YouTube channel. It's hard to find sometimes on your phone. YouTube makes it difficult, but if you go to a laptop or an iPad, you're going to see a join button usually right at the top and you just click on there. So today I wanted to talk about succession planting. I'm in Maryland zone 7. It is, well, 70 degrees today. I've been out in the garden and starting to get sunburned actually. Um, but cool season for us is really beginning of March, April, and even into May, the, the soil is still cool. My point is that if you are, you know, looking to start seeds, directly in your garden, just because these are cool weather crops, they can take a frost, they can take a cold. Like it says radishes will har uh, ready to harvest in 28 days. This lettuce is ready in 45 days. Um, this takes three to 10 days to germinate. This takes four to seven days to germinate. That is true under the right conditions. So like in my house, under my grow lights, these would germinate in you know four, five, six days, and they're gonna grow nicely putting them into the cold ground, they could take one week, they could take two weeks, they could even take three weeks to germinate. They're not bad, they just germinate more slowly. What you don't want to do in succession planting, well maybe you do, but I wouldn't recommend it, there's a lot of radish seeds in here. So if I put down um, say 50 radish seeds or 100 radish seeds March 15th, takes a while to germinate, they get growing, they're all gonna come to harvest date together. It's not gonna be in that 28 days. It could be 50 days, it could be 60 days because soil temperature impacts on how these, um, how quickly they mature. But if I have 50 radishes going or 100 radishes going at once, they all mature, I pretty much have to eat them all at once, which is fine if you love radishes. But if you do like 200 or 300, it's really hard to eat all of them. So succession planting is really about putting your seeds in the ground. Once they germinate, you wait two weeks and then you put in another round. And once those seeds germinate, you wait another two weeks and you put in another round. So you could do like 25 radishes in March. They germinate two weeks later, you put in another round towards the end of March, two weeks later after germination, another round in April. This way you're getting your harvest over a four week period and you can continue with radishes really it depends where you live but I can keep planting these through May so succession planting is just not you plant everything in March you eat it all and then you're done you can keep these cool weather crops going through the cooler period all right let me look for some more questions Deborah does the pineapple pear tree do well in Maryland. I'm in Maryland. I'm not familiar with the pineapple pear tree, but I grow bosk and Bartlett and other pears and they all do fine. So if it is similar to that, it should be okay. Uh, pear trees, peaches, plums, apples, nectarines, they all need a cold period and they're really good to, you know, below zero temperatures, you, you know, so they're hardy. So they need that cold period here in Maryland. So if the, if the pear tree you're talking about is similar to standard pears, it's gonna do fine. 
Erica, who is a member of Perk Memberships, anybody who has a colored circle and a star is a Perk member, what do you recommend to keep voles under control? We found evidence of holes in one of our raised flower beds. So they're really hard to control once they establish. And some people don't like this, but figuring out how to poison and kill them works. I'm lucky enough to have hawks in somewhat of an open space, so the hawks can tend to take care of it. I also have black snakes. They tend to take care of them. If you don't want to use poison, you know you have a vole problem. When you make new bed, you want to put in, um, it's called, uh, what, what's it called? It's, like, it's garden mesh. It's metal, and it's really tiny squares. And people put them on the ground. They put the raised bed on there, and that keeps the voles from digging in. Now, voles can get into fabric pots. There's not much you can do unless you line the fabric pots with the, the mesh. Um, I'll, I'll think of the name, but it's it's metal and it's just these little squares and the voles can't get through it. So that's more for prevention if you have a vole and a mole issue in your garden. But as for getting rid of them, um, you know, thinking about poisons, if that's what you're comfortable with, is the best way to get rid of them. They can really devastate a garden. You know, if you can trap and release, that's great. I don't know how to do that for moles and voles, um, but they can be devastating. Um, people also flood the area, you know, when they find the holes, they just regularly flood it with water and you'll know they'll do that every day and they make the habitat, it could drown them of course, or they make the habitat really inhospitable to the, the animals because there's so much water going through there. Checking to make sure the mic is on. For those of you in Perk members, you know that I do that. Hey, welcome uh, Leftridge, thank you for joining. And I got a pop-up that you just joined um, Perk Members. Perk, yeah, Perk Memberships <laughs> as a Perk member. Uh, all right, let me find out where I'm at. So I love, you know, I mean, I do 150 videos a year. I have over 1,500 videos that are public. Perk Membership is just an addition. Some people like to learn, you know, with a smaller class. The chats are usually 20 to 30 people. I stay on for an hour, answer questions, and it's a great community. The people there are really smart, so there's a lot of ways to learn about gardening. Public-wise, I like doing these um, Q&As twice a month, Thursday, second Thursday, fourth Thursday, but a lot of people come in, so sometimes I can't answer everything. Um, I'm not going to be able to answer everything, so, you know, I, I do my best. Jay, do you have a suggestion for vegetables to train up a very tall six foot set of trellises in partial shade? Thanks. Let me just think about the question. Do you have a suggestion for vegetables to train up a very tall? I don't know if you're asking for the vegetables to grow up it or you're asking for a trellis. So. It looks like vegetables. So partial shade is always tough because it means different things to people. So I would go with pole beans. They definitely get six feet. If they grow above it, you can kind of bring them down. If your partial shade is under six hours, I would go with the beans. If it's six hours, seven hours, you know, which is probably not, or you wouldn't be asking, maybe cucumbers. Um, but vegetable-wise, I would go with the beans. They seem to do the best overall. Trisha, also a Perk member. The leaves on my basil seedlings keep turning yellow and brown. Should I pick them off? Once leaves are turning on anything, you can go ahead and remove them. They're not going to come back. And then you would just be looking at basil if you're starting it. Um, Trisha, indoors, make sure you let the seed starting mix dry out more. They don't they can, like you can cut a piece of basil, put it into water, it roots out. So they're not, you know, super sensitive to water. But if they're starting to yellow, sometimes letting soil for your plants dry a little bit more before watering. Don't let them completely dry out. And if they're older and they're starting to yellow and brown, they probably need some water-soluble nitrogen because plants will always take 
resources from the bottom leaves, that's why they turn yellow first, die off, and then they send it to the top of the plant. But I would definitely remove them. Stephanie, is there any liquid fertilizer for acid-loving plants? Blueberries. Yeah, I do recommend. It's called Mere Acid. It's by Miracle Grow. Some people don't like that company, but it works and it's effective. Um, and I, I believe it's called Mere Acid. But if you do a search online and just say acidic water-soluble fertilizers, you should find plenty of options. The other thing that you can do is get elemental sulfur um, and sprinkle it around the plant base and then water that in and that does help change the pH too. And just FYI, because I just did a video maybe two weeks ago on blueberries. Blueberries only send roots down maybe 12 or 18 inches and they only expand to the really the technically the width of the canopy of the plant. So when you're adding the acidic fertilizer, you don't have to overdo it. It's just soaking into that top 8, 10, 12 inches of soil. And you don't have to go all over the garden. Just stay around the base of the plant. And for those of you that don't know, the acidity just brings the pH down. And the lower the pH, the more acidic, the better the plant is able to pull in nutrients. So, And my soil is higher in pH. It's clay. It's like a 7 the blueberry plants do well. I do the miracle Grow acid twice a year, end of the season, beginning of the season, or at times I've used white vinegar. I have a video on it. The miracle Grow acid or the sulfur is better just to acidify the area a little bit and then I let it go. So my soil is not super low in pH around the blueberries. Point being, they grow in a wide range of pH. If they're not flowering, if they look like they struggle, you probably do need to lower the acidity a little bit around them. Girl, foliage. Any suggestions on how to get rid of pill bugs in a raised bed? I noticed them hiding along the sides of my garden last month when I began sowing seeds for my crops. Not really. I mean, they'd have to, you could put insect dust down. That would kill them. That's up to you. Um, if they're just around and they're not doing much damage, I just kind of let them be. I've never had a big issue with them. You can clear out space where they might hide if you've got boards or containers around and stuff like that. Um, but if you know where they're hiding, if you want to put down a insect dust, organic, not organic, whatever you want to use, that's the best way to get rid of them. Trisha, do you have any recommendations on a catch and release trap? Gophers keep digging my potatoes and grow bags. So I have, um, just basic traps for squirrels because we get too many squirrels um they are just spring traps there's the rectangles they're all different sizes you'd have to get one for a gopher you lift up the side you set it you put a bait in the middle they walk in they step on a plate it closes you release them somewhere else and if you just look online for like squirrel traps or gopher traps you're just looking for the ones that are rectangle nice and long and you just lift up the side put in a bait and it closed. Nina, how do you how do you water your green stock towers? I'm tempted to water with a hose. I water with a hose. Like in the beginning when I have my plants smaller, I use the basin. I just fill it up, put the fertilizer in there. It's fine. As my plants get bigger, um, I just use a shower nozzle and I go to each pocket, water them in, and then I fill the basin and that's how I do it. Robert, how often should I fertilize sweet potato plants? Well, you really want to set up the soil well to start. And, you know, after that, let them grow for a little bit. But after four weeks, you know, when the plants, usually I say when plants are a foot or two foot tall, give them a good drink of water-soluble fertilizer. As they get bigger and bigger, um, especially if you're growing in containers, uh, every two weeks, you know, water-soluble fertilizer. They just take a lot. If you're growing in the ground or it's a really big prepared area, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be every two weeks to feed them, at least once a month with a water soluble fertilizer. But depending on the container size and how big the plants are, you know, every two weeks is a good rule of thumb. If they're massive and they're in a smaller container, you want to be watering just about every day. You want to be feeding, I think, you know, every 10 to 14 days. Caroline, question, 
on New Hampshire zone six, I'm in Maryland zone seven, if people don't know that, I have an overgrown strawberry patch when and how to organize. So now is a great time to just dig them out. Would, you know, if they're really close together, go you know down pretty deep with a hand shovel, pop it out. They're hardy. Even if the dirt falls off, you can move them around and put them wherever you want. But now is the time to thin them. They can take the frost. They can be moved around. They can do everything. They can go just about anywhere. That's how I, I propagate my plants, by digging them up at the end of the year, putting them into containers, and they just sat outside. Here in Maryland, it freezes. They froze solid. They're all coming back, and that's how I populate my plant. I appreciate the um, donation. Let me read that. Um, lawful. And if you do want to, you know, do a dollar donation, I will take your question right away. Thank you. I'm looking for a bamboo plant. Do you know a retailer? It's for privacy reasons. I would like to plant it in my backyard. What's the best time to start my bell peppers? New York area. So bamboo is very tricky. So I don't know a retailer um, to offer. But if it's for privacy, you're caught somewhere between wanting to have something that grows quickly and something that's not totally invasive because bamboo sends out all these you know, lateral runners under the ground deep, like sometimes 12 inches deep, and it will take over a whole space. So you really need to have a strategy for bamboo that it's, you know, in a place, a variety that doesn't spread or clump, but that may not grow fast enough for you. Um, or you want to really create, and it's a lot of work, a barrier that's at least 12 inches to 24 inches around so the roots can't spread to the rest of your yard it becomes a huge issue years down the line. So I wish I could help you more with that. Um, I mean, bamboo has a lot of functions, but those are the biggest cautions, is how quickly does it grow for what you want? And if it's a fast grower, how quickly does it spread and, how, and can it get out of control? What's the best time to start my bell peppers in New York City area? Um, so you're, I mean, you could have started a couple weeks ago. You could start them now, now definitely, um, especially if you're up north where it's colder. I like to get my peppers started a good eight weeks before they would go out in the ground. And the reason you have time is that if you, like even if you started them a month ago and you had these 16-week-old peppers or 12-week-old peppers and you put them outside into 40-degree soil, they're just gonna sit there. They're not gonna take off and thrive. So you have plenty of time now to start them. Get them to eight weeks. Wait till the soil's warmed up to 60, 70 degrees. Frost is gone, the days are warm. Even if your peppers are tinier, putting them into the warm ground, they're gonna just take off and go crazy. I would also recommend starting them in maybe a bigger container so you can let them grow. You want a nice big root system so when they get into that warm soil, the root system takes care of everything. All right. All right, let me just get things back on track here. Here's another question. Hold on. Question, flowering versus bolting, are they the same? If my lettuce is inside still, have a little stem and a bud, it's done. Yes, yeah, so it's done. So because you're starting cool weather crops in the house, the root systems get warm. So very quickly, like pak choy, bok choy, Chinese cabbages, lettuces that they've been in too long, will send up a flower stalk that's bolting. They are ready to set seed and I would start over. It is possible if you cut that off and you plant it outside in the cooler ground, you get a head of lettuce, but it can be, um, it's a sign that the, the plant has moved on. So I like to start my lettuces about four weeks minimum, maybe six weeks at the most indoors, and then get them outside. And you can, you know, even though now things might be a little messed up, you can sprout them indoors, you know, get them outside, still in a tray or whatever, and let them get growing. But you don't, I don't want you to feel like you need six weeks of growth indoors before you put your transplants out. You can put a transplant out at really any time. But if it is flowering, it is definitely, 
it's what's called bolting. You know, it bolts to flour to set seed in it, and you're done. I appreciate the donations there. Let me roll back to where I was. Hardware cloth. Thank you, Brandon. That's what I was trying to think of. It's hardware cloth. Thank you, thank you. That's for the Avols. Dorothy, which way do you orient your trellises? North, south, east, west, so they don't block the sun from the beds and plants behind them. To be honest with you, it doesn't matter. It, it depends on what your plan is. Because any garden is a square, even if we change it or turn it or a rectangle or a circle, it doesn't matter. You have your southern sun, you have your western sun, you go out with your phone, you point, you say compass, find out where southwest is, and that's where the predominant sun is going to be. So in your mind, you just think, okay, well, if that's where the southern sun is, I put a trellis right here, the sun's going to hit it, the shade's going to be cast that way. So you position your trellises based on the southern and western sun. And you sometimes people want to use a trellis to grow up beams, cast shadow onto the rest of their bed so they can grow crops in there that need cooler soil. So it's really up to you. And I do have a lot of trellising videos, and I, I'm sure I talk about orientation in some of them. And the idea would be, like, if this is your garden bed and south is right here, you put the trellis here, it's going to cast shade. So you put the trellis in the back. If you put a hoop trellis here, you can grow up the sides and around, and you still have sun coming through here. So it really depends on, uh, it doesn't depend. It, it starts with figuring out what south and west is, looking at your bed, and then figuring out, you know, how the shadow's going to fall. And some of the reasons, too, I mean, getting back to succession planting, is that we, like radishes, I don't recommend starting indoors. They just germinate well. Lettuces germinate quickly in the house and you can see when it's warm from that question they bolt and they flower just checking the time we're at 11 30 so we'll probably go 15 more minutes putting these out in march they're just not going to germinate and take off they like the cool weather but when it gets a frost they survive but everything is much slower so even getting these started getting a root system getting two or three um weeks worth of growth helps you kind of get a jump so maybe your first planting of lettuces are indoor seed starts. So you take them outside, they're growing, they look pretty good. Same time that you put your indoor lettuce outside as transplants, maybe in another space you drop in whatever, 15 or 20 seeds. I recommend putting in two or three seeds per hole, thinning them to one if you want a mature head. You know, you can keep more seeds in a hole if you're cutting them as, you know, as baby lettuce. But you put your first wave of transplants in and that's going to be what you eat first and then you seed outside they're going to germinate more slowly and this is what you would eat next i mean it's sometimes easier to eat 50 radishes but 25 heads of lettuce all at once is really hard to eat thank you coco i i have a 10 10 10 fertilizer i bought when i began gardening i used too much and never tried again how can i use it in a small garland in containers without burning it I hate to waste it. So it's perfectly fine to use. Um, it's not organic. You can use chemical type fertilizers. They don't hurt your plant. In this case, if you concentrate it too much, it changes the area and it can damage your plants. But it's not permanent. It goes away. What I would say is try and remember how you used it and how much you used and cut it down by at least 50 percent you know or look on a package of these types of fertilizers see what's recommended cut it down by 50 percent you can even cut it down by 75 percent meaning you know i don't know let's just say it said three handfuls in a 10 foot by 10 foot space well let's cut it down to one handful and you can lightly, just lightly scatter it around and let it just seep into your soil. That's a great way to introduce the chemical types because 
they're not going to hurt your garden unless that's all you use 24 7 and you use too much so you can still incorporate your compost your organic matter and you're just giving a sprinkling of the 10 10 10 mixed in there which is going to help your plants it's possible you know it's probably well, let me restart it's probably best used as lightly scattered across the surface than concentrating it into a planting hole. If you need a little bit more on that, you know, drop me another question on it. Um, Rebecca, question, my tomato seedlings are so tiny only now getting true leaves, do you think I should direct seed some in the garden now? No, so we're still gonna get frost. I know Rebecca's a perk member, so I know where her garden is. What's kind of cool is the tomato seeds will manage if we still get a frost rolling in. And because you're putting them in the seeds, they're gonna grow roots, they're gonna put out their first leaves, they can a little bit take a frost. I have tomatoes popping up and we had frost like last week. Um, so you could go ahead and do that. I would probably just give your seedlings a little more nitrogen and they're going to be okay, but there is nothing wrong with putting some seeds in the ground. And you could do an experiment, see how quickly those seeds that you put in the ground with still cold temperatures establish and then take off, you know, when it gets warmer. I think it'd be a cool, a cool experiment. Um, Karen, can I start seeds on my indoor grow rack and and soon as they are, put them in a protected sunny outdoor space? Marigolds, alyssum, zucchini, squash. Um, yes, you can. So one strategy when you don't have a lot of space in your grow room is you can get things germinated indoors and they send out the first leaves. Once they break the surface and they've germinated, that's what the cold slows down. So then you can move those you know, outdoors, let them get acclimated to the sun, grow outside during the day. You can bring the tray back in. You can put them in different places, but you can do a combination of that. And a lot of people do that. Like I'll, and it's a lot easier for me to do 72 marigolds in a flat, get them all started or germinated in here, then put them in my greenhouse and let them go. So you can do a combination of things. Um, make sure I saw this question, but make sure you put question there. Are pole beans good companion plants with cantaloupe? Um, I don't know, but I think it would work. I don't think they're going to hurt it. And I don't think one or the other is going to shade each other out. So I would give it a try. I mean, a lot of times I recommend to, to, um, experiment. So, you know, if, I mean, if you have a ton of cantaloupe foliage, maybe put the beans on the outside part of your trellis so that they're getting... A little bit more sun but it's definitely worth doing it or worth experimenting Gary what's your thought on the color of grow bags or any difference with heat absorption tan versus black I have not found any real difference the soil itself keeps that material pretty cool and the material doesn't heat up so much that it draws out the water yeah tan maybe a little bit better but I don't think the colors, I mean, we sell uh, root pouches, they're brown, um, black, tan. I don't think it's enough to worry about. I would go with the color that you most like for your garden. Equally wrong. I created soil with one third garden soil, one third perlite vermiculite one-third manure it drains way too fast um so a third of perlite and vermiculite is a lot i would stop using that and i would do one-third garden soil one-third peat moss one-third manure the addition of peat moss should slow things down or if it's going to hold water for you you could add in more peat moss um after you make your one-third, 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 you could add in some vermiculite. You don't need perlite. That helps sometimes hold water, but the peat moss should take care of that. Jana, day four of hardening uh, the cold crops. It's overcast and drizzling. Can I leave out for eight hours? 
they were out for five hours yes yeah you you can so any crops that are grown indoors have to get used to the uv rays of the sun cold crops are pretty tough you've done it for four days now you have solid overcast and i only say there's two types of days for acclimating solid overcast and sunny um, partially cloudy doesn't matter so full overcast yes you can do eight hours your newest book recommends planting blueberries in the fall however i'd like to plant them um, from pot of mature plants you can absolutely do it now you know fall's the best time get them established maybe they flower and fruit a little bit more but everybody would be buying um, potted blueberries right now from nurseries so you can definitely get them in the ground now just you know keep them well watered especially if it's cool they're going to be fine if you're planting them later like when things go on sale at home depot um, and I recommend keeping an eye out because maybe you'll get blueberry bushes for half price. If you're going into June when it's getting hotter and you're buying stuff half price, you just want to water them more regularly. Um, Debbie, thank you. So I didn't. So I use um, snail and slug baits, and my snail and slugs are under control. If I didn't do that, they'd wreck my lettuces and greens. So if you have experience with the pill bugs eating the baited sluggo that would make sense because the baits have sulfur or iron phosphate in there and it shuts the gut down of the snail and slug maybe it does the same for the pill bug all right so we are running out of time i'll go for another 10 minutes uh questions it's good to see lots of chats going on i have to keep saying stop reading what people are saying um except uh vicky i want to say cheers over in northland i love meeting uh nor yeah oh, <laughs> the netherlands i love meeting people around the globe like gardeners doesn't matter our religion politics country gardeners are wonderful people they want to know the same things. How do I stop this disease? How can I get my tomatoes growing more quickly? So I just love meeting gardeners from all over the place. Is it still time to move fruit trees? I'm moving next month and I want to take some with me. I would take them with you. Um, even if it's not, I'm not sure your temperatures, you would just want to stay up on watering that plant, very similar to the blueberries. Um, because you might have a bigger canopy and digging it out, you disturb a lot of the roots very quickly. That root system is not going to be able to support lots of leaf growth. So you would probably want to water the base really regularly, you know, every other day until you feel like it's it's been established. Yeah, your phone, if you, well, at least I have an Apple phone and I just say uh, compass and it brings up a compass. How many pole beans would I plant in a three-foot circle? Like a lot. <laughs> um, three feet. I mean, I would probably do them every four inches, maybe six inches around the circle. And I would probably pop a couple right in the middle. And guys, make sure you do put a question in front so I can pick them out. So Mind Heart is a perk member. Uh, brand new because she has or he has a dark blue circle. Do you recommend planting seedlings in tiny containers and then moving seedlings to larger containers or starting with larger containers? I always opt to start with the medium container and then out. So it depends on and like these are this is asparagus. So these are larger containers I sell at my seed shop. These have been growing in here since December. I'm growing really big roots in here. So in this case, I want a larger container. I don't want to keep having to do the work to pot them up. The real answer is, is how much grow light space do you have? So the smaller seed cells allow you to start more plants. The larger seed cells means you start less plants, but you don't have to pot up. I like potting up my tomato plants, or I like starting my tomato plants in the larger cells because I can just leave them there and I try and time them now to go outside into my greenhouse. The idea is 
Two, that the smaller cells require more watering, they dry out more quickly, especially as the plants get bigger. So if you have to travel and go away for the weekend, the bigger cells make a difference. So to answer your question, I would stick with the medium at least, if, if that works. Um, the larger containers, if you don't want to have to pot up, it saves you a step, and then I get, I get them right out into the garden. All right. Let's find some more questions real quick. Question, how many San Marzano tomatoes would you recommend growing in a 25 gallon grow bag? I'm thinking only one, maybe two, and the same questions for Romas, one or two. So 25 gallon grow bag is big. I sell the 20 gallon root pouches, fabric pots at my place. Your San Marzanos and your Romas are determinant variety tomatoes, so they're going to get to a set height, flower, fruit, and then you're done with them. I would definitely put two in 20 gallons. I'm trying to picture it. Definitely put in two. The issue is the more plants and the more roots you have growing in any container, the more you have to water and feed. So you want to set it up well with you know, fertilizer and compost. If you can water pretty regularly, I don't think you're gonna have any issue with two. If you wanna experiment, but you're gonna to have to stay up more on the watering, you could squeeze in three, but I would definitely do two. Jerry, I purchased cocoa core and it has a chemical smell. Is that normal? Purchased before and it did not have any smell. It should not have a smell whatsoever. Um, So I don't know what that is. I would try and look up the brand and research it and call them and find out. Um, but it should be pretty neutral smelling. Question. On 10, 10, 10, is it better to get rid of it? How often would you use it? So, I mean, I talked, answered that question a little bit before. I, I, would, I would keep it. It doesn't go bad. And the other way, thinking about your question to use it, is at the end of the year, when you're done growing, scatter it around, let it you know, go through, let's just say November, December, January, February, getting rained on and all that. And that's going to just spread it out through your soil. And you're not gonna have that issue of too much being piled on and burning your plants. So I would definitely keep it and maybe just use it at the end of the fall, at the end of the growing season. All right, love cat. Sluggo also kills pill bugs and earwig. So there we go. Question. Um, so fan, Gary, love your channel. What is the secret to growing the daikon radish? Really loose soil. So I've got daikons growing. They're radishes that grow long. They can be red or they can be white. They're in my 17 inch metal raised bed that has more of a loose soil and you know, hopefully they do good, but it's really about loose soil. All right. So I think I got to the end. I might as well just stay until 12. So 10 more minutes. If you had leak moths last year, do you think I can prevent their coming back by putting nets this year are they already established in the soil? I don't know how the leak moths work, but your thought is exactly right. If you put down any kind of insect barrier, you have to make sure eggs weren't already laid on the leaves and you have to make sure they're not coming out of the soil. So sometimes the trick is to use the barrier, especially if they're coming in from moths and other insects, but you do have to spray and treat your plants in the beginning just to make sure you kill anything off. And then for the daikons too, or radishes, I don't give them any extra nitrogen. I found that there's a risk with too much nitrogen that the plant just quickly grows lots of leaves and it's not storing up the nutrients and building up the bulb, you know, the radish. So I kind of neglect the radishes. Regular watering, definitely loose soil for the daikons. And I just, you know, you know, maybe a little bit organic granular, but the best stuff is to really put the compost down mix it into the soil, plant your radishes, and just let them go. 
All right. All right. Yeah, 10 more minutes. Um, good morning. How often to use AgroThrive for vegetables and flowers? So that is a big question, which I can't really answer. You, you know, because everybody sets up their plants differently, their potting soil, uh, their containers, their earth beds. So in the beginning, I'm just going to give you the example of transplant. So if I'm putting out a tomato transplant or I'm putting out cucumber transplant, I water it in with AgroThrive. When the tomatoes are about two feet tall, you know, the cucumbers have expanded, they're flowering. I'll give them another drink of AgroThrive. They're pretty good. Maybe mid-season, I'll water my, my tomatoes again or my peppers, same thing. For seed starts, you know, I prep the soil or for seeds, prep the soil, plant the seeds, water it in real quick with the AgroThrive and I just let it go for a while. You know, if your plants are growing longer and they're going to be growing the whole season, I don't really use it again until they're bigger, to be honest with you. In containers, depending on what is going on, and this is true for any water-soluble fertilizer, use it once to get them established, whatever you're putting in. After they're to a good size, they've been growing for a while, then I'll go to about once a month. When they're bigger, every 10 to 14 days in containers. Trish, that's kind of, um, I mean, that's a good way to do it. Like, so we're pretty close. If you follow me, you can kind of get cues when to plant. Um, same thing uh, with the PERC memberships. People are from different places and they're always talking about what's growing and going on. So, or garden clubs. If you can get involved with clubs online, like in Facebook or something like that, you can often kind of get cues from people in your same zone of when to plant and what to do in your garden. Bruce, I'm having a hard time finding vermiculite in my local garden stores in California. Is there a shortage this year? No, but you can get vermiculite for packaging through Uline, U-L-I-N-E. It comes in really big bales or really big bags. You do have to pay shipping, but even when it's all worked out, it's cheaper than sometimes buying it the way that you're trying to buy it. But I've not heard of a shortage. What's the best fence for deer, rabbits, groundhogs, raccoons, etc.? So the best, well, raccoons can climb. But for deer, rabbits, and groundhogs, cats can climb too. So there's not really the best fence unless you electrify it. So you'd have to electrify it for animals. Um, my fence is four feet tall. It has little squares about this side. So rabbits can't get through it. Uh, groundhogs can't get through it. Um, I, at the bottom of my fence, I put some wood like this. So things can't dig under it. On the inside of my fence, I have a lot of things. Deer don't want to jump over that. I also have posts that if I needed to, I could go up another two feet. So for rabbit, for deer, they say six feet tall. Four feet's working for mine. If you're thinking about a fence to go around the whole property and not just the garden, probably a six foot fence is what you're gonna need. And you want small holes. I have my, the metal on my fence is coated in a vinyl or something so that it lasts for a long time. Toaster, do I need to be a member first? No, so this toaster, I mean, it's a good time to kind of wrap up too. This is my, um, public live. I do a public live, so you don't need to be a perk member or anything. Every second Thursday, every fourth Thursday at 11 a.m. So anybody's welcome to join that. The perk memberships are in addition to this. I do have two books. I have Growing an Edible Landscape that just came out. And then this is my other book if you guys are interested in gardening. The Modern Homestead Garden. This really covers everything you need to know to get started. And growing an edible landscape covers gardening within your traditional garden, but also talks about bringing food out into your property in a little bit of a non-traditional way. Um, so if I missed your question, it's just because there's so much going on. So I, I, I just, I don't, I don't see them all. So I miss a lot every time. You can repost it if, you know, we get there before um, 12. What is your advice 
for year old wood chips for mulch. I I use shredded hardwood, which breaks down pretty quick. If you have old wood chips, mulch can be anything. So wood chips on top is not going to take nitrogen from your garden. If you mix wood chips through that top two, four, six, eight inches, that's going to challenge your plants for nitrogen until it decomposes. So you can put wood chips on top for mulch for sure. Grateful one. I've tried everything to save my garden from gophers. Suggestions other than laying wire under the beds. Um, I mean, somebody was just talking about trapping them, um, poisoning them. I know people don't like to kill stuff, but, you know, if I could talk to the squirrels and say, when you eat a tomato plant or when you eat a tomato, don't just take one bite. Just don't take one bite of the apple, you know, let's share. It'd be great, seriously, but it's chaotic and squirrels and gophers and stuff can just wreck your garden. So you do have to get rid of them. You could try trap and release. Um, but there's no easy way besides killing them or trapping and releasing them. Can I use play sand to combat fungus nets? I can't find decomposed granite. Um, so fungus nets, I mean, I think what you're saying, if you put sand, like an inch of sand on top of a container, it stops the life cycle of the fungus net because they can't get into the soil. So you could use sand for sure. Janine, I have 400 gallon grow, wow. I have a 400 gallon grow bag. I put sticks in the bottom, but don't have any leaves, tons of pine needles. Um, I would go ahead and use pine needles. People say they're too acidic, but what you can also do is just buy a small inexpensive bag of garden lime if you're worried put down your needles and then sprinkle some lime across it. That will regulate the, um, the acidity. All right, four minutes left. So just to recap too for succession planting, don't just think for your cool weather crops, you have to plant them once and be done. You can, you know, plant them every two weeks, every three weeks. And don't forget, come fall, we can plant these here in Maryland later August and I can grow lettuce, radishes and all the cool weather crops again through um, really September, October and November here now. Milky spore could kill micro, some microorganisms in your soil, but nothing that you would need to worry about. I mean, I don't want to say no, but it's not going to harm anything. Deadeye, what happened to those grocery store tomato seeds you saved? Also, what are my favorite disease-resistant disease, disease resistant varieties? Um, grocery store tomatoes? I don't recall. That one must have been a while back. Sorry, my memory is just gone. Disease-resistant depends on the disease, but I actually don't pay too much attention to that anymore because I spray my tomato plants with hydrogen peroxide, and that has been taken care of all the fungal issues and I, I just don't worry about it. I like the homestead variety. Um, a lot of the modern hybrids, which are not GMOs, they're great, they're resistant. I would go with those. All right, let's finish up with this last question from a new Perk member. When I mulched my tomato plants with wood mulch recently, I had a bunch of mushrooms that have thin white stem. Yep, we all get those black tops. Are there any issues need to be concerned with? No, just let them do their thing. Mushrooms will help decompose the, the, the wood. Um, you're not eating it. It's not going to infect the tomato. You know, mushrooms could always possibly be poisonous, but you're not eating them and they don't get into the system of the tomato. So you're perfectly safe. Um, they're going to pop up a lot too when it rains and it gets humid. You're going to see them pop up everywhere. All right, so next perk membership let me see if I wrote it down. I did, but I lost track of it. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Next perk membership is on, I'm sorry, perk membership is separate. The next public garden grounds, what I'm doing today, anybody can answer a question, is on April 25th at 11 a.m. So I will see all you guys 